just make sure that we're recording. Looks like we are recording now. Um, thank everybody for coming today. Um, as you may hopefully know, I'm A.G. Harmon of the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. On behalf of the faculty, let me thank you for zooming in to the last of our presentations in this year's Student Scholar Series. Uh, please stay on mute until the presentation and response are over, and now I'll open the floor to questions, uh, which you'll signal with the raise your hand feature. Um, we are being recorded, and this will be posted on our school's YouTube um, channel. The series was uh, initiated uh, 14 years ago in 2009 in order to recognize notable legal scholarship produced by members of the student body during the previous academic year and to foster the skills associated with presenting and defending that scholarship in a professional conference style setting. Today's presentation will be made uh, by Mary Delaney, who just graduated from our evening division this past January. So congratulations to Mary. Uh, before I introduce her, a few words about her respondent, uh, Professor Regina Jefferson. She is a nationally recognized authority on pension law, employee benefits, and tax law. Uh, in addition to teaching and producing a rich body of scholarship in these areas, she has been actively involved in the policy development of these fields. She has testified before the Congress, Congress and uh, briefed congressional staff on employee benefits and tax topics, and was a delegate to the first White House summit on retirement income savings. In 2015, she was appointed uh, by the President of the United States to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation's Advisory Committee for a three-year term, and in 2019, she was reappointed for a consecutive three-year term. She also uh, serves as an expert on taxation to the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations. She joined the faculty in 1992, served as the Dean of the Law School from July 1st, 2018, the June of 2019, and also serves as an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs uh, in 2000-2001. Thank you, Professor Jefferson, for being with us today. And now I'll introduce our student scholar, uh, Mary Delaney. Mary entered the law school straight from the completion of her undergraduate degree in finance from the Catholic University of America. Uh, this, past, uh, this summer, she will be uh, again working at the IRS Office of Chief Counsel within the large business and international divisions. She developed an interest in ERISA uh, after competing in the Nell A. Hennessy Moot Court competition in her second year, and this interest developed into further research and is what ultimately resulted in her choice of topics uh, for her law review comment, which is the basis of her presentation today. I'm going to turn the floor over to Mary to present her work on the demise of stop drop claims in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Fifth Third Bank versus Dudenhofer. Mary, I am now making you the host and you uh, can begin your presentation. Great, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Great, can you see my presentation clearly? We can. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Harmon, and thank you, especially Professor Jefferson, um, for your guidance on this topic. Um, as Professor Harmon mentioned, um, my interest in this topic and the basis of my presentation today is a paper that I wrote for a law review last year titled The Demise of Stock Drop Claims in the Wake of Dudenhofer. Um, my abstract um, here, uh, briefly summarized, is um, just to say that the presentation today will focus on a phenomenon referred to as stock drop cases, specifically as they relate to employee stock ownership plans, commonly referred to ESOPs, um, which are an area of employee benefit law governed by um, the, Empl the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Um, so the Employee in Retirement Income Security Act was established in 1974 and is the federal body of law that governs employee benefit plans. Um, under ERISA, uh, the, uh, the a fiduciary is subject to a number of duties. Uh, the most important for our purposes is the duty of prudence created by ERISA. It's referred to as the prudent man standard of care, um, which is stated in its full legal text on the right side of the screen here. But essentially, a prudent fiduciary acting under ERISA must discharge their duties of care with the ordinary skill, prudence, and diligence that an ordinary prudent person 
um, operating in a similar capacity would um, would do and how they would conduct um, their business affairs. Uh, so the prudent man standard of care is applied to all ERISA fiduciaries, but it specifically applies to ESOPs um, and requires them to continue to monitor, and it requires an ESOP fiduciary to continue to monitor um, the plan throughout the duration of employees investing into the fund. Um, while an ERISA fiduciary in general has a duty to diversify, what's unique about um, an employee stock ownership plan uh, fiduciary is that they do not have to diversify their uh, their funds. So um, what's unique about an employee stock ownership plan in particular is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to change my slide here. I apologize. Employee stock ownership plans in particular um, are, are different because um, employees gain ownership in the company uh, as a result of investing some of their retirement accounts into the stock of the company. So for example, the longer that an employee stays working for a company, um, they, they gain as part of their retirement portfolio some stock in that corporation, which is mu mutually beneficial to both employees and employers because it results in a an establishment of pride in one's company that an employee garners as a result. And it also benefits the employer because they are creating a workplace where the employees themselves are stakeholders in the success of the company. So everybody is working towards one common goal. Um, and there's an implied uh, there's an implied understanding that everybody's working towards the success of the company. So the employees want to see the company succeed because it means a more likely chance that their retirement accounts will develop over time and increase in value. And the employees are not paying cash out, outright, but rather they are just uh, creating an, an ownership interest in their employees. Um, when Congress specifically established the laws that created ERISA and uh, the laws that expanded ERISA to, uh, to include employee stock ownership plans, Congress expressly made clear that they wanted to promote the usage of employee stock ownership plans as a method of strengthening the free enterprise system. Um, and they were seeking to promote the usage of these plans uh, because they were, as with the creation of ERISA, they were seeking a more stable route for uh, retirement plans for employees to invest in over time and so that they can have some stability in the future of their retirement accounts. But as we'll see uh, throughout the course of this presentation, uh, the purpose of ESOPs and the intent to promote them as an investment vehicle has been frustrated as a result of the high pleading standard that was created in the wake of a, a case referred to commonly as, as Dunahofer by the Supreme Court in 2014. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so, um, a stock drop claims that arise and are um, generally the focus area of this uh, litigation that we'll dive into generally arise when one of two events occur. First, when there's a dramatic drop in the value of stock, um, kind of represented in the first diagram here, where there is a steady increase in the value of an employee's portfolio over time, and then a dra dramatic downturn as a result usually of something like a pandemic like COVID-19 or uh, as a result of corporate scandal. And the other situation that can result in a rise in this uh, litigation is a steady decline over time in the value of stock but no action taken on behalf of the employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries to correct, uh, not necessarily correct the downturn, but to freeze the investments in the employee stock ownership plans to uh, provide that stability that Congress intended for, um, uh, for employees to have. Uh, when these downturns occur, uh, it generally results in 
multi-million dollar scandals that are subject of various other fiduciary duty lawsuits, but specifically for our purposes, it results in a depletion of the retirement funds held by employees at these companies. Um, and while some amount of market fluctuation is obviously to be anticipated and planned for when planning for, for retirement, most of the, the heart of these issues results from, uh, I apologize, um, so the kind of foundational case for stock drop litigation regarding employee stock ownership plans is a Third Circuit case called Moink versus Robertson. Uh, this case was decided in 1985. Um, and the standard created in 1985 is a... Um, uh, a presumption of prudence that was established by that circuit court. And it provided that an ESOP fiduciary who invests in the assets of employer stock is entitled, is entitled to a presumption that it acted consistently with ERISA by virtue of the decision to continue investments. Uh, it was kind of just implied that the, uh, the ES ESOP fiduciary was acting prudently, that they were monitoring their investments, and it created a kind of high threshold for plaintiffs to meet in order to bring a successful claim. Uh, and that was the standard for nearly 30 years until um, the Supreme Court decided a case called Fifth Third Bank Corp versus Dudenhofer, which is now the standard. Um, and in Dudenhofer, the plaintiffs were investing in the stock of their company through an employee stock ownership plan. And they brought suit after the value of their stock dropped um, nearly 70%. So it's kind of the first one of those stock drop case graphs that were on the previous slide. Um, and the court in its decision over uh, rejected the Third Circuit's hold, holding that there was a presumption of prudence created. And they did this because primarily it was a high standard that was recognized but they also created a three-factor test for courts to consider when deciding whether or not there has been a breach of a fiduciary duty by employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries. And the most important really, and, and where all the litigation sense has centered is on the third prong of that test, which states that, um, it, it states what's known as a more harm than good standard. Um, it, it urges lower courts to consider whether a prudent fiduciary in the defendant's position, the, de the defendant being an ESOP fiduciary, could not have concluded that ceasing investments in the employee stock ownership plan would do more harm than good in the long-term uh, result of the stock valuation. And so the court um, decided Dudenhofer as a result of, of an array of circuit courts struggling to um, decide when to adopt the presumption of, pre of prudence from Moink, but as a result, it created this uh, more harm than good standard, which has proven to be even harder for plaintiffs to meet to successfully allege a breach of fiduciary claim under ERISA. Um, the holding in Fifth Third Bank Corp versus Dudenhofer, as stated here, uh, the most important part, like I said, is the more harm than good um, aspect in the in the kind of last sentence there. And so, in the wake of Dudenhofer, there were several cases. Um, I have listed a, a handful here, some of the more prominent ones, but um, there were several cases throughout an array of of circuit courts, nearly all of them faced with similar issues as the one in Dudenhofer where employee stock ownership plans were accruing um, employees' contrib contributions over time. The stock declined rap rapidly um, in Dudenhofer nearly 70% and uh, even more in some of these other cases. And all of the courts in the wake of Dudenhofer have found that there was no plausible alternative action that a fiduciary could have taken uh, that would not run afoul of securities law. And when they applied the more harm than good standard, they found that um, the case could not pass uh, the even the pleading 
phase of litigation. And so all of these cases resulted in either a dismissal outright or a judgment that favored defendants and awarded no relief to the plaintiffs who spent years contributing to plans that were then essentially left with a zero dollar balance or, or a close to zero dollar balance in their in their retirement accounts. Um, and so effectively in the wake of Judenhofer, um, the viability of a successful ERISA stock drop case is 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 hardly any. Uh, I mean, there has yet to be a, a successful case. Uh, so plaintiffs have a hard time um, alleging any type of mismanagement despite corporate scandal, despite um, drastic events that dis earlier disclosure could have potentially saved some of their retirement account and um, funds. That remained true um, after 2014 um, th through 2018 when the Second Circuit decided a case called Jander versus Retirement Plans Committee of IBM. Um, in Jander, the Second Circuit's holding created what has become known as the inevitable discovery theory, which stated that a, pr a prudent fiduciary should make an earlier disclosure of inside information regarding the value of stock if the disclosure would have been in inevitable. So while still applying the um, prudent st standard of care under ERISA, the second circuit kind of read that to mean that if the earlier disclosure of a scandal or wrongdoing um, would, would prevent some of the additional harm if it could lead to employees ceasing their contributions into a, a retirement plan. Um, and if that can be done without violating the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, regulations and disclosure requirements, then a prudent person, a prudent fiduciary should take those steps to prevent future harm rather than allowing investments to continue in the plan. Um, the Supreme Court granted cert to review this case in 2020, uh, which many hoped would address some of the problems that developed in the wake of Dudenhofer. However, despite having the opportunity to finally address some of the anti-litigation or anti-plaintiff um, litigation trends that, that we've seen since 2014, since Studenhofer was decided, the Supreme Court ultimately um, vacated the order of the Second Circuit without addressing any of the merits of the claim and just um, remanded for them to consider um, some of the additional arguments that were made in briefs submitted to the Supreme Court for their review. So it was kind of deemed as some legal professionals as the Supreme Court punting on the actual issue at hand. It didn't, it, it, would, it would have been a prime vehicle for the Supreme Court to address some of these trends, but rather than doing so, it was remanded back to the sec, to the Second Circuit uh, without further commentary. So while some uh, plaintiffs in particular and uh, ESOP investors hoped that this would provide some more guidance on some of these trends. Um, it, it ultimately just went back to the Second Circuit. And unfortunately, in the end, the Second Circuit wound up ruling and uh, finding for the defendants as well in another defendant favoring um, uh, series of the case. Uh, when the Supreme Court um, was uh, remanding gender, though, there were two uh, concurring uh, opinions submitted by Justice Kagan and Justice Gorsuch um, that were included in the remand, um, neither of which, again, commented on the viability of the claim or what plaintiffs can do to state a more uh, viable claim in the future. But it was there was there was an interesting uh, back and forth between Justice Kagan and Justice Gorsuch because specifically uh, they comment on whether or not an earlier disclosure what result an earlier disclosure could have for uh, employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries and Justice Kagan um, wrote that an ESOP fiduciary may have an obligation to take action under ERISA even if it is not required by securities law essentially finding that there could be a time when an ESOP fiduciary should disclose additional information, even if not required by 
securities law, as long as it doesn't conflict with securities law. Um, however, the, the second concurring opinion um, commented voicing support for defendants similar to the other Supreme Court and lower court holdings that we've seen that uh, found in favor of defendants, but also kind of disagreed with Justice Kagan, stating that requiring an earlier disclosure, disclosure by employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries would require those ESOP fiduciaries to take an additional action in their role as usually corporate officers that is not generally required by an ordinary ERISA fiduciary. And since that step is not, that additional disclosure is not a step that is referred to as uh, something that a run-of-the-mill ERISA fiduciary would be required to do, it would effectively impose a higher duty on ESOP fiduciaries and kind of single them out from the remainder of ERISA fiduciaries. And so that concurring opinion disagreed with Justice Kagan, um, and that dynamic is left unresolved and has created an open door that potentially if a ESOP fiduciary claim is brought before the Supreme Court in the future, um, it does leave an open door as to how, how that duty might be resolved. Um, if it can make it past the pleading standard, what what disclosure would be required and when, and effectively would it be required under ERISA or would it be an additional pleading standards or an additional disclosure specifically for um, ESOP fiduciaries? Post-Jander, um, there have been more cases that we have seen um, that result in similar uh, trends uh, where the plaintiffs are not successful and even making it past the pleading stage. Uh, Allen versus Wells Fargo was a very interesting case brought in the Eighth Circuit where uh, employees of Wells Fargo were contributing to an employee stock ownership plan as a result of their uh, employment at Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo's stock price was greatly overvalued as a result of uh, corrupt sales practices going on within Wells Fargo as a company. Uh, and when those sales practices were disclosed, um, which were inevitable as a result of uh, an ongoing uh, investigation, uh, the value of the stock dropped dramatically um, over 70% at like in Dudenhofer. Um, and the plaintiff's argument was similar to the Second Circuit's, uh, or, or I'm sorry, similar to the argument that was made before the Second Circuit in Jander, essentially arguing that because of the ongoing um, investigation, the earlier disclo or the disclosure would have been inevitable, and so an earlier disclosure would have been prudent under the fiduciary standards of ERISA. Um, however, despite that argument, um, and consistent with some of the other cases, uh, the uh, Eighth Circuit rejected that argument. It, it was brought up to appeal before the Supreme Court, and uh, once again, the Supreme Court denied cert. And so rather than, again, addressing some of these issues, um, this just being a, a recent one as of 2021, so a, just a year um, after its previous opportunity to address um, this same issue, the Supreme Court uh, denied to, to review the case, um, and it ultimately resulted in a, another defendant favorable outcome. Uh, some of the other ones here, again, listed just show that the trends post gender, so just post 2020, um, do suggest that Dudenhofer obviously remains good law. It has not been overruled at all by any changes by Congress or by the Supreme Court. And in effect, it is providing this high bar for plaintiffs to meet in the pleading standard or in the pleading phase of their of litigation. Um, interestingly, I, I find here uh, the third case, Fargo versus um, General Electric Company, that is a Second Circuit decision. So despite the Second Circuit's um, attempt in the past to provide some plaintiff uh, relief uh, post gender and post the remand to the Second Circuit, it does appear that the Circuit Court is the Second Circuit Court is falling in line with some of the other circuits and uh, is not focusing on the split that we've the circuit split that we've seen in the past. 
Um, and so with that being said, it does indicate that there is a need for change in order to protect the interests of plan participants in employee stock ownership plans. Um, in Dudenhofer, the Supreme Court mentioned that in the absence of special circumstances that render mar the market price unreliable, an, an ERISA fiduciary can prudently rely on market price as a fair assessment of the stock value. And uh, the reference to these special circumstances that would render that market price not reliable it has been vague and left undefined by the Supreme Court. And so effectively what that has created is a presumption of prudence similar to Moink, which was um, rejected by the Supreme Court. Uh, relying on market price as a fair assessment absent these special circumstances has in effect resulted in a presumption that the market price is fair, that it's reliable, that uh, that a fiduciary can uh, continue to prudently just al allow um, plan participants to deposit all of their funds into um, an employee stock ownership plan without providing any disclosures that would uh, cease investments at an earlier point to protect or correct some of the uh, d decline in funds that we've seen from some of these other cases. Uh, public policy also supports the change either through Congress or through the Supreme Court if they were to re review and actually make a judgment on the merits of one of these uh, cases to uh, better identify what a plaintiff can do to state a viable claim in the future or to actually address some of the wrongdoing of corporate officers within their uh, roles as employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries. Uh, the more harm than good standard has had an adverse impact on plan members as we've seen. Um, all of these cases that have come up in, since 2014, there's been dozens across pretty much all of the circuit courts um, have resulted in cases being dismissed and no plaintiff relief for the, uh, you know, million, million, multi-million dollar cases that result in a, a complete wipeout of retirement funds. Um, while the Supreme Court has recognized that employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries are subject to most of the same duties of fiduciary duties of ERISA fiduciaries and the duty of prudence, uh, the holdings of these cases have been inconsistent with the kind of legislative intent of ERISA. ERISA um, was a body of law created in order to provide a better, a, a more stable uh, vehicle for employees to to have a body of law that that protects their interests in in litigation and to provide a retirement plan that will result in the outcome that they anticipate. And so the fact that all of these employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries have been successful in dismissing claims brought against them before the merits of the case in the wake of these scandals can even be addressed um, has been inconsistent with Congress's intent, both in creating um, employee stock ownership plans as a vehicle to be used and against the body of law of ERISA as a whole. Um, if these cases continue to be dismissed, uh, it, it leads to some questions as to what benefit employee stock ownership plans even provide to employees. And ultimately in the end, if the entire collection of their funds and their retirement accounts can just be eliminated. Again, the employee stock ownership plans are not subject to a duty of diversification. So we're talking about all of the funds that a plaintiff has being held in these employee stock ownership plans. And so when that is effectively wiped out as a result of a decline in stock price, as a result of corporate scandal, uh, the the purpose of an employee stock ownership plan really is, is defeated entirely. Um, and so it, it's contrary to both public policy and um, has an impact, an adverse impact on plan members. Um, so in conclusion, um, if 
the Supreme Court continues to not weigh in on some of these issues, um, we are likely to see Supreme, uh, circuit courts continuing to dismiss claims. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has generally, in other ERISA claims and employee stock ownership plan cases, been um, hesitant to weigh in on plan governance issues. But in, a, in situations like employee stock ownership stock drop cases, um, I, I think the need for some commentary is necessary. Otherwise, as I mentioned, it will create a disincentive for participation in employee stock ownership plans. Uh, stock drop litigation is likely to continue despite um, the lack of viability of plaintiff claims. I mean, as we've seen, there have been over five in just the last year or so amongst the circuit courts. And you know, over a dozen or even more since 2014 when Dudenhofer was decided and this high pleading standard was created. Um, so plaintiffs continue to face an uphill battle, but stock drop litigation continues to be brought in all of these circuit courts. Um, it continues to go up to appellate review for consideration by the Supreme Court, even if it's not ultimately um, awarded. And um, that is a trend that I, I don't see going away anytime soon, um, especially because, as I mentioned, all of these uh, litigation issues arise as a result of multi-million dollar um, decreases in stock value. Um, so given that, um, I, I would imagine that litigation continues, um, and I would hope that the Supreme Court takes a step to address some of these open questions in the future. Um, Thank you. I will turn it back over to Professor Harmon now. Thank you, Mary, uh, for a, a very uh, comprehensive and, and, and uh, very competent uh, explanation of this important and complicated topic. Um, I'm gonna turn things over now to Professor Jefferson and she will conduct the response. Thank you. And I, too, would like to uh, thank Mary for such a well-researched and, and thoughtful presentation on stock drop claims uh, and to give us more uh, explanation of the current status of, of this uh, situation with respect to ESOPs. And so I would like at this point time to pose some follow-up questions to you. Let me begin with uh, this question. In your paper, you identified and described the challenges um, that ESOP participants face in successfully bringing claims against employers for fiduciary breach in stock drop cases due to an excessively high pleading standard. If this issue is not resolved soon, where do you see this problem leading? And more specifically, what impact will the current split on what constitutes a valid claim have on future litigation? Yeah, thank you, Professor Jefferson. Um, as uh, as we saw in, in the the number of claims that have been brought post Dunahoffer and post Jander, uh, the there has been a consistent um, series of claims being brought despite the lack of viability. So I don't see stock drop litigation slowing down anytime soon. Um, we have seen that high number of cases continue. And again, the only circuit that there has even been like a glimmer of hope in is the second circuit. But even that circuit wound up ultimately ruling and in, in consistent with some of the other circuits when the case was remanded from the Supreme Court. Um, however, since that circuit continues to be the only circuit that has provided any vehicle for plaintiffs to successfully bring their claim, um, I would imagine that it might result in some amount of forum selection uh, from plaintiffs to bring their claims in the Second Circuit in the future. ERISA has a uh, some liberal venue provisions which allow lawsuits to be brought in any venue where the plan is administered, uh, and specifically with employee stock ownership plans. The plan is administered anywhere where employees are actively working and where um, the funds are being contributed as a result of, of those contributions. So for larger companies like Wells Fargo, for example, one of the, the more recent ones, uh, they have employees in you know every state across the country. So that liberal venue provision would allow um, plaintiffs to kind of do some forum selection and potentially bring their claims in the Second Circuit, hoping for a consistent outcome like in Jander, um, but hopefully not the part where it goes up to the Supreme, Courts and, uh, Supreme Court and gets remanded. So um, I, I don't imagine 
uh, stock drop litigation will slow down anytime soon. I think it might result in forum shopping. Um, and I would not be surprised given that the Supreme Court has had the opportunity to uh, grant cert uh, in at least two two different cases in the last three years. I'd imagine they have the opportunity to do so again in the near future. And, and I think a lot of people would hope to see them uh, take that opportunity to, to address some of these open-ended questions. Thank you. Now, in your paper, you state that the stock drop problem could be addressed in one of three ways. Um, one, you say that there could be early disclosure. Second, you say that it, this could uh, be addressed by appointing independent third parties to serve as fiduciaries of ESOPs. And third, you say that this could be corrected by amending ERISA to include a duty to disclose. Okay, with respect to those three, would you please elaborate, first of all, a little bit on each one of those and then identify which one you believe would be preferable and tell us why? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the first option would be an earlier disclosure, which is what Justice Kagan was mentioning in uh, the, the gender concurrence. Um, that would be an additional disclosure that are not required by securities law that would alert um, plan participants to the potential for uh, it would alert them of, of an ongoing investigation if one is being done or of any other uh, big market impacts, Im impacting factor that would have that would have on the value of the stock. Um, so an earlier disclosure would allow plan participants to either cease or continue investing in the plan at that point, and it would take the burden away from employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries and put it back on the plan participant and give them more control over their plan. Um, the second, uh, the second um, option, I I believe, was uh, appointing an independent third party fiduciary, and. Uh, doing that would eliminate some of the uh, problems that Justice Gorsuch had mentioned. It would take away the duality of corporate officers acting as fiduciaries, as, as ESOP fiduciaries. And so they would not have the problem of acting as a fiduciary and a uh, corporate officer, for example. Um, and an independent fiduciary could be uh, less biased and would therefore be able to make a more independent uh decision as to what would be prudent in, in their capacity. And to answer your question, the last, op the last option being uh, congressional uh, action by, or I'm sorry, action by Congress to pass new legislation, I, I think that would be the most effective at addressing this issue. Um, when Congress created ERISA, obviously the point was to protect plan participants and create some guidance and stability for them. And I think that if Congress were to take steps to um, modify ERISA with an additional duty to disclose, it would lead for the least inconsistency amongst application of courts um, and create a standard that all employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries could adhere to. Um, it might take more time in the beginning, um, kind of like a as a as a change in practices, it would it would essentially be an additional duty which everybody would have to modify their plans and, and get used to. But I think it would be the most beneficial for plaintiffs in the long run. It would protect against some of the harm that we've been seeing in some of these cases, and it would provide the most clear guidance for fiduciaries also, so that they're not subjecting themselves to additional and frivolous cases, but just making sure that they're held accountable for the duties that they have as a fiduciary. Thank you. You have stated that the failure to hold employers accountable as ESOP fiduciaries in stock drop cases is inconsistent with the legislative intent of ERISA, which was to increase retirement security for plant participants. Considering this inconsistency, do you believe it appropriate to continue to view ESOPs as qualified retirement savings plans and to afford them the same tax treatment that other qualified plans receive? I, I think that, um, as you say, the, the current litigation trend seems contrary to the intent of ERISA. Um, and if the Supreme Court doesn't address this issue, and if employee stock ownership plans continue to be um, treated inconsistent with the remainder of 
ERISA plans and, and qualified benefit plans in particular, um, I, I don't think that they should be treated the same. Um, I think that as Justice Gorsuch stated in the gender, in the gender concurrence, um, treating them, treating an ESOP fiduciary and an ERISA fiduciary um, kind of seems to not align if we do impose an additional duty of disclosure. And an additional duty of disclosure seems to be the only course of action that would result in a, a benefit for plaintiffs at this point or a successful uh, plaintiff claims going forward. Um, so if we can't provide the stability and the corrective action that we need for uh, plan participants going forward without separating the two, I, I think it would I think the resolution would would lie in separating the, the two groups. So separating from ESOP fiduciaries from from the remainder of ERISA fiduciaries and treating an ESOP not as a qualified benefit plan, but as uh, some other type of quasi group with still uh, some benefits, but not uh, the ultimate benefits that a qualified benefit plan has. Okay, thank you. And if we have time, I have one more uh, question for you. And um, you. You've given us a very good uh, explanation of the current status of claims for uh, fiduciary breach with ESOPs. What do you believe plaintiffs could do in this current climate to potentially make it past the pleading stage? Yeah, I think it's a very open-ended question um, that we've seen. Uh, you know, not many plaintiffs have been able to successfully do so. But going forward, I'd imagine that. Uh, the viability of a plaintiff's claim might depend on whether or not they can point to specific instances of like a specific point in time where an earlier disclosure could have been made and kind of just point to a, a, a place where they can say had investments ceased here if it would have been prudent for investments to cease here uh, the ultimate harm would have decreased as a result. And so applying the Dunenhofer more harm than good standard, you know, if a disclosure would, ha would have been made earlier, it cannot be said that it would not have resulted in more harm than good, that, that an earlier disclosure would have saved some of that benefit. So I think trying to identify that point in time uh, probably is the, the only thing a plaintiff participant could do in the future until uh, we receive more guidance from either Congress or the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you. And that actually concludes the questions I um, had for you. I will turn it over to um, Professor Harmon at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, uh, Mary. Um, we're going to have a, uh, a Q&A now. Uh, anybody in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand. I'll start with Professor Walsh. Thank you for this presentation. It's super interesting, you know, and, and one of the benefits of Zoom, at least, is that you can look at the opinions as it's going and kind of, uh, and it does seem like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the government, the position of the government is something I'm trying to understand a little bit better here, because in Dudenhofer, they said, well, look, it, the presumption's not right, but, um, uh, you know, like, and then you had the more harm than good, but it would be nice actually to hear from the government, maybe nudge, nudge, right? And then uh, in gender, the government comes in and says the second circuit got it wrong. Um, you should just follow the securities laws. And the Supreme Court says, well, you know, you didn't, those weren't raised below. And then the second circuit eventually reinstates. And um, I'm trying, can you help us understand um, the government's position? Is it the kind of issue um, that might change with a change in administration? So for example, um, is it you know, is it a sort of political in that sense, or is this more of a turf battle between the, the government lawyers for the SEC uh, on the one hand and the other set of government lawyers who'd say, no, you need to focus more on ERISA? Yeah, I, it's a great question. I don't think it's something that will change with the political climate or like a change in administration because these cases have had a consistent outcome over the past couple of decades. Honestly, um, they've, they've really all been... Um, you know, pro defendant at the, at the end of the day, and ultimately, um, so I, I don't think it's something that uh, will change as a result of a change in political climate or administration. I think that what has led to some of the confusion is um, the fact that I think the Supreme Court has been reluctant to uh, comment on plan governance as under ERISA, uh, because generally under other employee benefit plans, uh, this. 
courts in general don't want to uh, read into management of the plans. They'd rather leave that to fiduciaries. Um, but without a kind of reading too much into ERISA and in the absence of the Securities and Exchange Commission providing any commentary, it kind of just creates a gap in the law where the Supreme Court's hesitant to uh, kind of govern plans directly and, and they shouldn't have to if plan agreements are are um, created correctly and, and followed prudently and there's the laws to support uh, employee benefit plans. Uh, Courts, read, courts self-governing uh, plans is, is not something that, that we want to see. So courts are hesitant to do that. The Supreme, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, I think, has left a gap in whether or not an earlier disclosure might be required by an ESOP fiduciary. And so it's kind of left us in like this limbo state where um, there is just an uncertainty of what a plan participant can do to allege a wrongdoing in the future, and it's just resulted in favorable outcomes for uh, defendants, if that answers your question. Yeah, that, that's helpful. It's, it's, you know, I've just found my, my view is maybe perhaps cynical, but the justices, when they say, oh, it's ERISA, like, we don't know, government, tell us what to do, right? It's the same thing in tax cases. It's like the government comes in and it's like, here, tax is really complicated, but we'll help you justices, so that if the, if the SEC were to change its position, the court would change its position. But if the SEC comes in with new arguments, they're like, yeah, we don't know. You're not telling us what to do, so we don't know what to do. Um, Regina, do you have anything to add to that? Well, what I, I would add is that uh, historically, I, I think I, I would agree that the court has been reluctant to uh, handle risk of cases, but that hasn't been the case in recent years. In recent years, the court has entered, in fact, I, I think it was a couple of years ago, they actually had three ERISA cases dealing with different issues. And so I think that might, um, their reluctance might change over time, just because it appears that there's a greater willingness to address the, um, you know, the complexity of ERISA, because for sure it is a com complex subject matter. So I I do believe the court apparently is getting more comfortable with that. And so we might see, as I said, a, a willingness to um, to not only look at this issue, but to even uh, delve into other issues in the future. Um, maybe Mary and uh, uh, Regina, you can help me with something. Uh, how popular are mm. these things, how ESOPs? I mean, how uh, have they empirically, can you say how popular they are? And has that in any way been impacted by um, this change in pleading standards? And uh, I, I would assume that, you know, if somebody wanted to do this and they knew that, you know, the holding people accountable for, for what you've um, talked about has become more difficult, that would, that would change uh, um, their view of whether they wanted to participate in this or not. But how likely are they to know? Uh, let's just go back to the, how popular are they? How they are likely, how likely are they to know about this change and the likely effect that that would have? Yeah, I, I think that they are a, a very popular and commonly used vehicle of investment and retirement planning. Um, I, I think that one of the reasons why um, the duty of of diversification was excluded from employee stock ownership plan fiduciaries was because um, there was an assumption that uh, encouraging employees to uh, generate ownership in their company, partial ownership through through stocks and shares in their company would result in everybody like working towards a common goal that nobody wants to necessarily see crash or 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 burn in the end. Um, and I think most people participating in an employee stock ownership plan also have a 401k or an alternative retirement um, fund on the side. But despite despite having both employee stock ownership plans continue to be very beneficial. Uh, it's a benefit that you receive uh, that's not necessarily a, a direct cash out from your employer, but is something that uh, you can just contribute to while you're continuing to be employed by the company. So it's mutually beneficial for employers and employees, which I think is what, what has led to some of its popularity. Um, and I don't think that that's something that has we've yet to see a, a decrease in popularity on. But I, I do think that the lack of stability in the future, if if these large publicly traded companies continue to um, have impacts, unforeseeable impacts, such as the pandemic, for example, where, where stock prices just as a whole, the market just 
just crashed or in the wake of scan more particular scandals um, if there's a crash it, it leads to a lack of stability that participants want to see and have obviously when planning so I, I do think if not addressed it can lead to a decrease in popularity but um, as of right now, I, I believe that is all just speculation as to what might come in the future, and they have not yet decreased, but Professor Jefferson might have um, an, an, a different opinion, potentially. And, well, I, I certainly agree uh, with what you said, Mary, and I would add to that, though, that notwithstanding their popularity uh, among policymakers, I think it is common um, um, knowledge as well as a common concern that these plans are inconsistent with, um, for the reasons you just described, inconsistent with existing pension policy, no diversification, allowing employers to deal with plans in ways that they wouldn't be allowed in other uh, other qualified plans. But going to AG's, uh, to Professor Harmon's question, you know, implicit in that question is why do we have them? I think that some um, policymakers will say, well, if you're comparing it to having no plan, it's better than no plan. And so that's debatable. I, I mean, I, I might reveal my own biases because I do think sometimes having a poor plan is worse than no plan at all. But some have argued that at least by having an ESOP, even if it's not ideal, it does encourage people to save for retirement, whereas they otherwise might not. Now, some of the scandals that we have had recently, I think, make it surprising uh, that people continue to invest in employer stock. In other words, if you think about it, just as Mary mentioned uh, when she was giving her presentation, so Certainly one of the realities of an ESOP is that everything is in one. Your, you know, your current compensation is driven by your employer's uh, situation. And now when you have an ESOP, your retirement is tied to that. And so it truly is all of the eggs in one proverbial basket. So there are, are definitely risks there, but a lot of research has been done on why employees, why employees would continue to disproportionately invest in stock. And whenever employers allow you to invest in stock, it seems that people do it. And some of the behavioral economists have ex given some explanations for that. They've said, well, if your employer allows you to invest in an ESOP or even in a, another plan that just includes uh, employer stock, maybe employees are afraid not to do it. You know, that might send a signal to your employer, oh, I don't have the confidence that, that I might should. Some of them, I think, believe that presenting this option to invest is an endorsement. And so they think, surely, if you are allowing me to do it, it must be OK. Um, and then some of them, I, I think, maybe overestimate, um, you know, as employees, as, as Mary explained, employees essentially own uh, the companies. And so they might overstate um, their, you know, success at, at running a company. So I think there are multiple reasons for why that outside the, the pension policy regime for why people tend to invest in them. But they are going back to what Mary said. I agree wholeheartedly. They're very popular. I can't give you, um, Professor Harmon, you asked for a number. I can't give you um, a specific percentage of how many plans there are, but I can tell you that this is not a small percentage. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we have uh, about exhausted our time here. Um, uh, another engaging topic. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, for ending our, our series this, this uh, semester, P Professor Jefferson, for her um, insight as always. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we will come back next year for our 15th um, uh, set of, of talks. Uh, thank you all for participating in it, and uh, we will look forward to uh, the story that will be put on the website. Uh, Mary's uh, video and, and Professor Jefferson's response will be on our YouTube channel. See you next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Oh, thank you. Bye -bye.